I'm Sally Lockwood, and on this Sky News Daily, we're looking at AI and jobs. Now, it's not that long ago that I was talking to our science and technology editor, Tom Clark, on this podcast about AI. We were looking at ChatGPT after it seemed to become this huge thing almost overnight. And we got it to write a little limerick about Sky News. There once was a channel named Sky, whose news made the hours just fly, with anchors so bright and stories each night. They kept viewers' spirits on high. (laughs) There you go, Sally. Anchors so bright. (laughs) Even then, its capabilities seem pretty mind-blowing. But since, it feels like AI is making fast and furious leaps. It's leading to a lot of uncertainty. Will my job be replaced by AI being one of the biggest questions? But should that actually be, how can it help my job? Well, Tom's put it to the test, tasked by his editor to create an AI reporter. As climate change remains unabated, being prepared is our best line of defence against the blistering onslaught of a hotter future. Sky News AI reporter. So how did it compare? Can we be replaced? Let's find out. Okay, to do that, I've sat down with Tom and all the way from Norway, we're joined by YouTuber and coder Chris Farhali. Tom, Chris, it's so great to have you here. Um, Tom, before we ruin the punchline um, and reveal (laughs) quite how threatened you feel by this AI reporter stealing your job, tell us about what you were trying to achieve here in this experiment. I think the idea is we've heard so much about how AI is going to replace our jobs. We've heard a lot about misinformation as well, you know, what threat it could pose to sources of news, etc. And some pretty extreme doomsday scenarios. And we thought, well, one way to test that shortly is to see how far we can push it, you know, see whether it can do my job or, or something closely approaching it. That was effectively the starting point. And that's where you got in touch with Chris. Tell us about how that conversation went. Well, we, we needed help. I don't have the ability to code myself. We knew we had to go a little bit further than just typing a prompt into ChatGPT saying, you know, write me a news report. We, we know it can do that. We know it can simulate that. But can it actually do anything approximating the job of a journalist? So. We found Chris because he's a a prominent YouTuber. He's been playing around with these AI tools for a lot longer than most of us have even been aware of them and was already interested in this question about how to make them replace various tasks in in the work that he does. So he seemed like the perfect person to approach. Well, that's a good time to bring you in, Chris. So what did you think when you were approached by Tom with this idea to create an AI journalist, an AI reporter? And have you ever been asked to do something like this before? Uh, Well, first, I have not been asked to do something like that before, but um, I have already, when they asked me, been doing some kind of version of this. So I had some idea what we could actually try to get this to work. So, uh, yeah, I was very excited, actually, when I heard that. So okay, and then, Tom, what were your criteria for what a good journalist, a good reporter needed to be? Well, it had to be factually accurate. It had to be able to have a sense of what a news story was. And it had to be able to write and organise its thoughts in a way that conveyed that story to other people. We spoke to Chris and he came up with some pretty smart ideas for how to give it those abilities to sort of yeah, emulate the thought process. Bear in mind this thing can't think. To emulate that sort of thought process that, m- that might be going through a, a journalist's head. I think I should let Chris kind of explain the the architecture behind it, if if that's not too grand a term, Chris. Yeah, so basically, to put it quite simple, what we wanted to do was to create, maybe not Tom, but like an AI reporter. And I also wanted to create this kind of agent, as I call it, like an AI editor. So when the AI uh, reporter had something to say, we wanted the editor to look at that and critique it so they could go back and forward. So to create this, we had to kind of to create two different agents that can chat or talk to each other kind of autonomously. And we also had to feed it some data. Well, we had to give it an awareness of, of news, didn't we? So we, you, you came up with a way of, of getting that into it. Yeah, because like with everything, when we talk about chat GPT, we need some good data in to get something good out. We could take some data from the Sky News YouTube channel and we can look at some news searches on Google so we can take some data relevant news and we have some 
and news uh, articles on the Sky News website. So if you feed all of that information to an AI reporter, it can try to look at correlations and maybe come up with a good story. It could come up with some news pitches that it could feed to the AI editor. So basically, isn't that what kind of a journalist do? It comes up with some pitches they want to deliver to an, I don't know, an editor maybe? Exactly. And then the AI editor would sort of task the reporter with subsequent jobs. It would ask it right now, go away and find data, information, reports to back up your idea. And then when it was done with that, the reporter would go back to the editor and the editor would prompt it again, now go and find some interviewees, some experts to speak to. And we didn't have a hand in that process. Once we'd tasked them and written those instructions, it was meant to run autonomously. And remarkably, it, it did a very good job of doing that. Your AI reporter did produce quite a believable story about heat and rising temperatures. That's right. I mean, it, we, didn't, we didn't guide it in any way. We didn't tell it these are the sorts of stories we want. We excluded some things that which we knew we wouldn't, for ethical reasons, want to stray into. So stories about court cases or recent tragic events, we just decided were things we had to avoid. But it came up with this story about heat waves. And that's obviously very topical. Not today, the temperatures dropped down to about 14 <laughs> degrees. But last week it was boiling when we were in Norway, it was 27 degrees. And we were having big questions about what that means for society. And it had an understanding of pressures on the NHS. So it came up with this story about what the pressure that heat waves are going to put onto society and onto healthcare systems with projections of more heat waves going forward. It went out when it was prompted to find evidence to support that. And it found recent academic articles and things like that to support its story as well. And again, I found it really remarkable. Now go and find three people to interview. With a few exceptions, it kind of did imagine a couple of experts that we couldn't find in real existence. But it also did find a large number of people who were exactly the kind of people I would want to speak to about a story like that for Sky News. Tell me, both of you, if you can, how you managed to create how the AI reporter looked and sounded. So in a way, this is two parallel streams. So the brains, if you will, with all the caveats in there, these things can't think, these are language, language models. We decided to give our AI reporter a persona. But that involves an entirely different type of AI, sort of effectively deep fake technology. Yeah. And that, that, that is another equally fast moving and really impressive part of AI. But we pulled two bits together there to give it that. And it, for that, all we did is we took somebody from the newsroom, our producer, Hannah, and we got a, a quick recording of her, about a four minute recording of her reading essentially random stuff. It happened to be some old scripts from reports that I'd written. She read them out into camera. That was enough to train the AI both on how she looks and her mannerisms, but also her speech. And once we got that, we could put any text we wanted into our AI avatar and it would read a report. So what we decided to do is take the, take the scripts that Chris's AI, the ChatGPT powered AI had generated and plonk that into our AI avatar to get a persona to our reporter. Public health departments have been quick to respond implementing measures like cooling shelters during extreme heat events. We have to adapt to heat waves. They're, they're happening much more frequently than they used to do. Uh, and so we need to take care, look after people who are vulnerable during heat events. But as our experts suggest, these initiatives might not suffice given the projected increases in severity of these heat waves. There's an urgent call for robust policy responses from climate change adaptation strategies to more funds for community cooling centers during periods of extreme heat. As climate change remains unabated, being prepared is our best line of defence against the blistering onslaught of a hotter future. AI reporter, Sky News. She's been described as someone who looks like she might have just graduated uh, from journalism school, which uh, I think we all sounded a bit like that when we graduated, didn't we? But actually, you know, physically it was very convincing. In terms of actually pulling a television report like that together using AI, Tom, were you impressed with the TV report? I was. I have to say, my initial impression was how very good it was at emulating the, the style of writing. You know, short, punchy sentences, and then the AI's ability to organise its thoughts in a kind of logical way. And even this kind of, it's a, it's a bit inside baseball hit, but this thing called a piece to camera, the bit the reporter says to camera. It's sort of got the tone of that right and put it in the right sort of part of the report too. So in that way, it was kind of scary. Oh, my God, it can, it can write a TV script like I do. And it 
did it in 20 minutes. And it's been considerably longer than that, on, even on a busy news day. Do you know what I mean? So it was impressive on some levels. Where did it fall down? I think what was clear from the kind of stories we got, it doesn't really understand what news is. And kind of how would it if all we're giving it is what's already out there in the news? So often it was taking two things that were being reported in the news, you know, spending pressures on the NHS plus increased waiting times and saying, take those two things and discuss. But a lot of its ideas were quite what I would say is a sort of feature article, a kind of a step back and analyse two sides of a story. It wasn't able to sort of see and react to things in the news in the way the news reporter does. Your reporter also produced some less accurate stories. In fact, one that was completely <laughs> made up about milk making this was, road surfaces safer. And this, I think, in a way, this is the most enlightening and informative part of our experiment. You might remember there was a crash on the M6 motorway and a milk lorry overturned, spilled its load. 20,000 litres of milk spilled all over the road surface. It had obviously seen that in its news search data. But what it did next was incredible. It came up with this idea. I'll read you some of it. Hang on, because I've lost my glasses. Sorry, just a sec. An AI reporter wouldn't <laughs> need glasses, I'm just going to say. It definitely wouldn't. Um, this is its story pitch. A shocking incident on the M6 motorway. We delve into the unexpected aftermath. It's since spurred a scientific investigation into the potential environmental benefits and innovative road safety measures that could result from milk spills. And what it said was that some scientists had reacted to this spill and discovered that if you put milk on roads, it binds grit together, making them less slippery. Which is completely made up. As far as I can tell, yes. And it even cited research from the University of Madison, Wisconsin, and a study in New Zealand where they'd shown this. I couldn't find evidence of any such studies. It also said that milk going into waterways nourished ecosystems, which we also know is not true. They just pollute them. It was completely and utterly wrong but and I think what was really informative about it it was plausible in a way it kind of made a reasoned a very confident case for why this should be came up with experts to interview there was a couple of clues that might be wrong one of them was called Mr Dairy which I, th I thought was, <laughs> it was maybe a clue there that was but it, it fabricated a story without any involvement from us. And, and I just don't know where it got that from. And the scary thing is, had that been published, it could have fooled people and it appeared convincing enough. Chris, what went wrong here? So what I think kind of what happened here was that um, the model always wants to perform well, right? Uh, and when they picked that story or kind of those ideas, it didn't really find a good way to make an interesting news story about milk spills. So I think, think it kind of just made something up. You can say that or hallucinated or lied. I don't know. This and, was probably and Chris was explaining yeah. to me that hallucinations are this. They're a well-known phenomenon with these language models. Right. They are trained to come up with it. Yeah. With, as Chris was saying, with a good answer. And if they can't, our whole AR community is working at how to stop them doing this. But they will just offer up something that looks like it fits instead. These so-called hallucinations, as mm. they're known in AI, potentially they could create real problems if they well, were to be used for real news. Yeah, well, I think the, the point that's highlighted for us was that the AI could generate, maybe if it wasn't something as egregious as this, if it just maybe fabricated a name or a location or a bit of evidence to support one of its claims, and you weren't there to really check and make sure that that was absolutely accurate, it could quite easily be taken for the truth because as Chris was saying these are trained to generate plausible language and that could be quite simple to, to slip past someone who doesn't know better so I think it definitely raises the big red flag where we talk about the potential for AIs whether willfully or completely accidentally to generate misinformation I think it, it really highlights that that potential risk for anyone using AIs but obviously particularly for someone who trades in accurate news reporting. And Chris, having seen what you've seen in terms of the product and the reporter that you and Tom have developed, do you think that they could potentially replace journalists or are we safe for now? Uh, I think you're safe for now. Uh, but uh, I think uh, both me and Tom said like this could be like a tool for journalists to kind of augment, to get good ideas, to get good headlines. I completely agree. I mean, just stepping back and thinking about this, what we've learned is that an AI can't replace my job. But what is also clear, certain tasks that I do in my everyday job could be replaced by AI with, obviously, human involvement going on around it. 
And we're already seeing AIs replace you know, transcribing audio or converting text into the voice. We already use those tools on a daily basis in the Sky Newsroom as well. And I wouldn't be at all surprised. In fact, it's inevitable that we're going to see more and more gradual sort of involvement of AIs in aspects of roles we do. Well, in light of all that, nice try, Chris. But I think Tom's safe for now. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thanks, Sally. Tom's AI reporter was far from perfect, but the stories it could produce were still pretty impressive. And AI is developing at lightning speed. As Chris said, if this is what can be done now, what will the AI of the future be capable of? And what will it mean for our jobs? Carl Benedict Frey is Associate Professor of AI and Work at Oxford University's Internet Institute and has been looking at how advances in technology have changed the way we work for decades. Professor Frey, thank you so much uh, for coming on to speak to us. I know you've written a lot about AI. You've advised governments, big business on the future of technology and and whether jobs are vulnerable to computerization and artificial intelligence. In short, are they? Yes, they are so very much indeed, and it's something we've been seeing for a long time. Uh, for the past 20, 30 years or so, computers have gradually taken over middle-income routine tasks that are easily specified in computer code and can therefore readily be automated. But as we're seeing now with artificial intelligence, being able to learn in a more bottom-up manner rather than having been pre-programmed by a human, they can accomplish an even broader set of tasks. And that means that the potential scope of automation is actually much greater today than it was 20 or 30 years ago. Back in 2013, you predicted that almost half of jobs in the US could be lost to automation in the next few decades. Do you still think that? I would still very much think that the potential scope of automation is vast, right? Although I should say that, you know, there has been some surprises in types of tasks that artificial intelligence can do. Back in 2013, when we first uh, published the paper, we thought that, you know, AI is quite unlikely to do creative work. We thought that it's quite unlikely that AI will reproduce complex social interactions um, anytime soon. And um, I still think human workers have a comparative advantage in those domains. But, you know, the speed of change has been greater than we anticipated back then. That's extraordinary that you now even think that artificial intelligence could be threatening creative jobs, jobs that one would have originally thought would require more uh, human brain power um, and more nuance of thought. And, and just on that, our science and technology editor, Tom Clark, has been testing out whether AI could take his job as a journalist, as, as a reporter. Are there certain jobs that are more at risk than others? So according to our estimates 10 years ago, it's not, you know, mostly the skill jobs, it's mostly low skill, low income jobs that are likely to be outright replaced. So it's the work of cashiers that are likely to be replaced by Amazon Go. It's the jobs of truck drivers that are most likely to be replaced by autonomous vehicles. But in addition to that, what we see in generative AI uh, this time around is that even creative professionals are now feeling the force of automation, right? What we're seeing with generative AI is that it's easier for somebody who's not a great writer like myself to produce average or quite decent uh, text, uh, write decent essays. It's uh, a lot easier for somebody who's not a great designer to actually be a fairly decent designer. And it's easier for somebody who's not a software engineer to write fairly decent code. So it means it reduces the barriers to entry. More people can do these type of activities Activities. And the question then becomes, right, are people are going to consume then a lot more content as it becomes cheaper to produce? And, and, and I think that question is sort of somewhat analogous to asking yourself, would you watch, you know, Netflix a lot more if it was cheaper? And I think the answer is probably no, because you simply don't have that much time to consume more content. So I suspect we're going to see more competition, but not, you know, a, a a significant increase in demand, and that is going to mean lower wages for a lot of workers in creative professions. Which, of course, is not good news for many. And, of course, humans do have unique value. What can't be replaced by AI? So if you think of recent advances like ChatGPT, it's very good at reproducing human ingenuity in basic text communication, right? But it's not very good at, you know, 
in-person type of interactions. We don't have robots yet that, you know, reproduce uh, the kind of uh, abilities that humans have of communicating in person, right? So you might use ChatGPT to write your love letters, but then when you go on the first date, you better be good at, you know, uh, in-person <laughs> communication, right? So what ChatGPT and AI is likely to do is to put a premium on in-person communication. I'd be intrigued to see what those love letters sound like. And yes, as you say, the first date could end up being quite disappointing if they if they can't back it up. If AI does continue to progress at the speed that we've seen recently, is there, is there a chance that we could end up missing out, that we could end up uh, losing, that simply can't be replaced by computerization? Well, there's always a risk of us losing things as technology progresses, right? I mean, before the first industrial revolution, people lived and worked at home, surrounded by their families and children. When factories first arrived, a lot of young men in particular, all of a sudden clustered in factory cities under appalling working conditions and away from their families and loved ones. So there was suddenly something being lost in that transformation. And obviously there's a risk with artificial intelligence that we are losing something again. As I said, though, I think, you know, artificial intelligence does put a premium on in-person interaction. So I'm hopeful that we're, you know, going to spend more time in person because that's where we add the most value and that that's uh, going to enrich our lives. 